Hey everybody, it's a, uh, it's a balmy 25 degree morning here in New England. It's uh, mid-January and uh, we've got some really wild wind out there today, which is making the uh, wind chill really nasty. So we got uh, not supposed to go above 28 today and then with the wind chill they're predicting that that's going to make it be like the teens all day today. And I don't know if you can really see that but those trees are moving pretty good it's just a constant howling wind and a couple of the gusts have been big enough that I can hear the house framing creak so that's a good healthy <laughs> that's a good healthy wind I'm just glad I'm not out there so I'm gonna do a little bit of a flea market find segment this is gonna be this is gonna be a little bit of flea market a little bit of eBay a little bit of the pawn shop uh, it might even be something from the tool store that I haven't covered yet uh, even the uh, we're gonna start right off with the, uh, the the Salvation Army store. The day that I picked up that PS2 uh, unit for three bucks that I ended up um, cleaning up and getting working, uh, really didn't need that much. Um, the same day I was there, I saw this. I spotted this stereo receiver and it looked you know pretty clean. And uh, again, not knowing whether it worked or not, got this for like three or four bucks, I think. Uh, so this is, um, I'll take this downstairs and hook it up and play around with it later. This is a Nico NR300. And for those of you who are not familiar with the name Nico, N-I-K-K-O, it's a Japanese manufacturer uh, from the like uh, late 70s uh, into the 80s, I believe, they were making product. And uh, I don't think they're around anymore. I never hear their name. But they actually made a decent, uh, decent stereo receiver. This is an old analog unit, you know, uh, analog tuner. It's got the dial string. In case you don't know what a dial string is, is actually a string on a series of pulleys that uh, goes around um, the shaft behind this knob right here, and eventually um, act, has goes to a plastic wheel on the. Uh, tuning capacitor and also uh, moves the dial up and down and that was always a fun job when one of those would break to uh, restring one but anyways I digress so that's just something I wanted to show you because I, I I tend to pick up deals on all kinds of things and I don't really need this but I remember from my days of working on these um, doing consumer electronic repair and everything that this was actually a decent product and it's pretty clean. Um, looks like somebody may have dropped something on it. I don't have my tripod up here, so I apologize for shaky camera. Oh, and speaking of cameras, I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, some of the binding posts on the back here for the speaker um, outputs are a little bent. And this hole right here with this wire hanging out of it, that looks so horrible. That's actually just the AM antenna has been broken off. So not, you know, not a horrible thing. Don't use the AM a lot. Um, the other interesting thing about this one, you don't see anymore. Um, this has circuit breakers in lieu of what they typically used back then was speaker fuses. And now they don't even bother. Uh, now they pretty much have uh, circuit protection built into the uh, amplifying stage. And really the circuit protection that's built into those things is it's it's really there just to preserve more catastrophic failure inside the device and uh, protect your speaker um, voice coils in your speakers from being melted because what it tends to happen is if you get a short circuit on a uh, amplifier output stage transistor or more modern might be even an IC chip you're going to get voltage flowing through the uh, voice coil of the speaker and uh, it won't take long for that to melt that coil and, and destroy your speakers. So in modern equipment they tend to have uh, a relay or something that's going to open and disconnect the speakers and stop that from happening and that relay is controlled by a protection circuit that's monitoring for uh, DC voltage at the output. But anyways, this one actually has circuit breakers. 
So I bought that other junky PS2 at the uh, flea market, and I had mentioned that the guy had a couple of controllers, and I didn't buy them. And well, my son showed me that on one of the controllers that we did have with the original uh, setup, uh, it was like separating here and kind of junky, and the other one was kind of small. So um, I decided to go back and get these controllers because he had told me that he usually gets only two bucks a piece for these, which I thought was a pretty good deal, especially if they're working controllers. This one, somebody even took the time to coil up and put a plastic band. But these, these look like they're in pretty good shape. But then I was going to get these, and I knew he had said two bucks a piece on those, but then I spotted... So then I spotted this. This is uh, looks like it's aftermarket by the coloring. This is a uh, PlayStation memory card. So I don't quite see what this says on it. Maybe somebody put their name on it or something. So I don't know if that works, but my son had already said to me, he said, you know, Daddy, can you, can you get one of these memory cards because it doesn't store like any of my, when he goes and plays the hockey game, for instance, when he selects his team and all that, it doesn't store any of that stuff. So I said I'd be on the lookout for one. Sure enough, this guy had one. And then I was digging through his stuff a little more, and lo and behold, I found this. A brand new still in the package, original Sony PlayStation memory card. Now this, this one's an 8 meg. I don't know how big this one is. I think 8 meg was standard for these. So I decided, well, what do you want for the whole package, the whole thing? Five bucks. So that was a real good deal. Then I went to another flea market, a small one that I had never been to before, and I found a guy in the back had all kinds of video game stuff, and he wasn't there. And this was a, uh, one of these ones that's in a building, and it's almost run like an antique co-op, where pretty much the people run in the place. If the, if the dealer's not there, they pretty much can deal on his behalf. Um, so this one here, this is a original, in-the-box, unopened network adapter for the PlayStation 2. And he had video game systems there, and the used video game system prices he had on there were kind of high. But he only had 10 bucks on this, and I asked the lady there whether or not... Uh, she could accept eight, and she said sure. So I got that for eight bucks. Now this, for those of you who don't know what this is, this sticks on the back of your uh, PlayStation 2, and it does a couple of different jobs. It's a network interface. Uh, so I think this is actually a data cable plugs in here. Yeah, it says do not connect to phone line. Yeah, so this isn't, this isn't a modem, this is a, um, even though I think it says modem somewhere on here. Yeah, it says Ethernet slash modem, but the, the truth of the matter is it's an, it's an Ethernet adapter. But the other thing it does is on the back side of this, it has a, uh, I'm pretty sure that this has the plug, which allows you to be able to uh, install a hard drive in the PS2 for... Uh, I guess, I think you could actually store the games on the hard drive instead of having to put the discs in all the time. I might be wrong on that, but I don't know. But that has the software disc and everything in there. And so I actually decided I think I'm just going to resell this because I, uh, I think I can double my, my money up by uh, dumping this on eBay because I really don't think he's going to get that involved with the PS2. Uh, that he's going to get to the point where we're going to want to do that. We'll probably just play the PS2 and... When we get bored with that, we'll we'll get an Xbox or something. Who knows? Oh, that reminds me. I, I got to watch what I'm saying over here because uh, my older boys, my 13-year-old son Peter and my 11-year-old uh, son Aiden, they're watching my videos. So, turns out they're the ones. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, hi, boys. If you're watching this one, no, I'm not buying you an Xbox, Aiden. All right, so now I'm up here in the uh, bedroom, the uh, Sanctor Sanctorum, and uh, don't tell the wife, she wouldn't appreciate it. I'm not going to show you the bedroom because uh, she wouldn't appreciate that. Anyways, uh, the reason why I'm up here is because most of my books are up here and I wanted to talk about books. Written, rotten, arithmetic, that kind of stuff. Anyways, um, I've got quite a few books here uh, related to machining, machinery, mm, machine tools metalworking, whatever. And uh, some of them I just acquired recently. Some of them I've had for quite a while and just kind of forgot about. So I'll check these out. Uh, the reason why most of them are up here in the bedroom, not because I do a lot of reading before I go to bed. I tend to be on the internet before I go to bed. 
I do most of my reading in the library, which is adjacent to the bedroom. I have a nice porcelain chair in there that I tend to use for my reading. It's a specially designed chair, and you don't need to wear pants when you're on it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is um, Machine Shop Theory for Tool, Die, and Machinist Apprentices, second edition, by the National Tool, Die, and Precision Machining Association of Washington, D.C. So this... Uh, oddly enough, this, this book is dated, uh, according to this, date of something, I don't know what that says, Southbridge Public Schools, but then over here, there's another stamp that says Property of Bay Path Vocational Technical School, that's the school that I graduated from, uh, Voc Tech School in Charlton, Massachusetts, Vocational Technical School, so, um, what I think happened was, I think that, uh, Back in 68, uh, this was in the, the Southbridge public school system, and then as a used book, it ended up migrating and getting to Bay Path, because Bay Path wasn't in, in existence back in 68. Uh, in uh, I think Bay Path was built, I want to say, like around 76 or 78 was when the school opened. So that's kind of interesting to me. And uh, this is copyrighted 67. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Copyright 64. Sixth printing, 67. So this is uh, kind of a neat book. It's got some, some good basic stuff here. Tool angles, uh, grinding tools, milling cutters and milling. So this is kind of nice. It's good information in this book. A lot of these books I have have a lot of repetitious information. So I don't remember even where I got that book. That was quite a while ago I acquired that. And I know at the same time I acquired that, I got this book, which I was just going through recently again, Metal Work, Technology, and Practice. So this is kind of a neat book because this isn't just about machining. This is pretty much all different types of metal work. So there's, uh, there's chapters in here on uh, heat treating, chapters on threads, chapters on cutting metal, chapters on working with sheet metal, uh, measuring. Um, there's a lot of like explanations of different processes done in industry. Like it starts out in the book, basically talks about how that how basically steel is made. The you know the different processes, how they turn ore into different metals. Um, and then in the back here, we get into the more specific machine related stuff. Here we've got uh, you know. Well, that's actually a shaper, I think. Yep, shaping an internal keyway on an old shaper. So this is an old textbook from Bay Path. This is copyright 1975, so this would have been right around when the school opened. This is another Bay Path former textbook by the looks of it. And this one uh, is beat to hell. The cover's ripped off, the binding's missing. I would have thrown it out a long time ago, except that I found it so interesting. This is one of the first ones that I got. Uh, this one is called Machine Tool Operation. And there's section one and section two. Uh, so section one focuses on safety, measuring tools, bench work, the drill press, the lathe, and forge work. Section two focuses on the shaper, the planer, the milling machine, the grinding machine, hydraulics, metal band saws, metallurgy, and cutting fluids. So this book is copyright 1959, uh, but the copyrights go all the way back to 1919 on this book. So 1919, 1936, 1941, 1953, and then 1959. So this book is uh, a lot of old school stuff in here, but there's really good information in here too. So I really enjoy reading this book. Um, Here's a whole section right here. I actually had something marked on the page. Cutting speed. So that's uh, that's a good one there. Oh, somebody highlighted something in that. What did they highlight? What did they think was so great? Somebody highlighted the side of an Acme thread is for... I highlighted this. I remember I took a night school course at Bay Path years ago. And one of the projects I did on the lathe was I made a... 
a um, a piece for my father-in-law's tailstock on his craftsman wood lathe. And it had a uh, big like thumb wheel arrangement that when you turn the thumb wheel, it would move the tail piece in and out. And he wanted a longer one. So he gave me the uh, one that he had and asked me to recreate that longer. And I did. And it ended up having an Acme thread. So that's why I had this. That's interesting. Funny how the mind works and things come back to you. Now, a while back, I showed you guys a uh, green toolbox, a metal green toolbox. It almost looked like a tackle box. And a, a wooden uh, stand with two drawers in it. And that had some uh, machinist stuff items in it. And, and uh, I had mentioned that I had bought that at an auction over 20 years ago and just never did anything with it. And then finally went through it. And, and this book, even though this is another Bay Path book, this book... I remember this book actually came with that um, that whole box. So this is machine tool operation also. So this might be, this looks like it's just a newer version of that same book. 1960. I think this is the same book. Oh, you see the size of that? Wow. What the hell was that? Anyways. Yeah. That might be the same book. Planer work. Shaper. Shapers and planers. You don't, uh, you don't really. I, I was at an auction. I had a big, big uh, shaper like that. And uh, I don't think anybody bid on it. Even though scrap prices are down. Oh, this book says right on it. This is part two. So maybe that other book is just part one. And this is the newest book. I just purchased this at the flea market a couple of weeks ago for two bucks. This is a nice hard-covered textbook. Probably, this is a Pearson Prentice Hall. This is Kibby Meyer Neely White are the authors of this. This is the 8th edition of Machine Tool Practices. I think this might be a college textbook. Not positive. But this is, uh, this is copyright 2006, so this is a lot newer. This has even got some color photographs in it. How do you like that? Well, anyways, so this is definitely geared towards a, this is a companion book for a, uh, you know, for, for a, a course. Oh, look at that. They're showing you the chips. I even saw a picture of a lathe with an Alora's tool post on it. Anyways, using a study rest and followers. So that's going to be a cool book to go through. All right, so before I go down to the basement and show you the next item, I just wanted to mention that I'm using the bloggy right now in 720 uh, mode. Uh, not full HD. And the reason why I tend to use this on 720 instead of 1080 is because... In seven in 1080, the zoom feature is disabled on this on this model, which is annoying. But uh, I've heard the pleas for better video quality, and uh, I have taken notice and purchased a new camera. So I'm going to unveil that today. But I'm going to start by uh, I'm going to switch this this camera to 1080 mode just to see whether or not that makes a heck of a difference, and uh, then we'll go down and we'll look at the new camera. Okay, so this is the same camera, my Sony Bloggy, now in 1080 30p. So that's uh, 30 frames per second, I believe, progressive, I think. And that's the max that this camera is uh, capable of doing. Uh, so anyways, I don't know if that's going to look much different than what we were just looking at. When I render this video and process it, I'm going to process it as full 1080 it's going to be a huge file. It's going to take longer to upload, but hopefully with the new broadband cable uh, internet, it won't be horrible. And uh, we'll see how it goes. Oh, I forgot about these two little books. This is one of the first books that I actually bought brand new for uh, metal work. This is the Metal Lathe for Home Machinists. I found this on Amazon by Harold Hall. And there's some there's some little projects in here and that, uh, and there's some information in here that's pretty good. But 
the the thing I didn't like about this book is, um, well, for one thing, I believe this gentleman is in England um, or somewhere in Europe because everything in here is pretty much assuming metric. So he, he talks about, you know, imperial, but the reality is you've got to do some conversions if you want to do any of these projects and everything, which isn't that big of a deal, I guess. But he's talking more about uh, metric, and then he also uses terminology that is unique to uh, his country of origin, where he where he is. The way that they call things are a little bit different here, so that takes a little bit of getting used to. And it's just you know it's not a huge book. There's not a ton of information there. He also kind of like doesn't doesn't fully cover even some of the projects. He alludes to the fact that he like basically expects you to just you know, use this as maybe a foundation and then run with it. Like this last project, I uh, call it uh, a milling cutter chuck is what he calls this thing. Anyways. So then he also has a book on milling. Milling a complete course. Alright. <laughs> so, so this is uh, the same gentleman uh, so I got this for Christmas and, you know, after experiencing this book, I probably wouldn't have asked for this book if I had, uh, you know, known I was going to get it and, you know, no, no, de no, no offense to Mr. Hall. I mean, but I just, I, I think I'm going to get more out of this, um, so he's got some projects in here, little projects. And th this is a good book for um, a true hobby machinist who might not even have a full-size milling machine and might be just dealing with a mill drill. He talks about how his first unit was a mill drill and the shortcomings and how he overcame some of those by making some of his own things and, and stuff like that. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's for what it is, it, it's a good book. All right, guys, so I ended up uh, searching for cameras on eBay, and I was looking at camcorders that could do full HD that are chip-based. I don't want uh, a hard drive-based camcorder because I was looking at used units, and I always worry about, uh, you know, used electronics or, or can be dicey anyways, and especially if you've got any moving parts, which a hard drive has moving parts. So I just, my, my philosophy is that the... Uh, the hard drive based camcorders are going to be less reliable uh, than the uh, chip based ones, the ones that use SD memory. So I started looking at those. Well, it turns out there's quite a few deals on those to be had. Uh, they're kind of being phased out. Um, and in big part, it's due to the fact that many new phones now are capable of shooting such great video in HD and also. The fact that uh, most of your higher-end SLR digital cameras in video mode are superior. As a matter of fact, when I was doing my research on what kind of camera I should be using for my YouTube, you know, all, all things considered, uh, I'm not talking about like, uh, you know, I'm going to strap something onto my head and go out on my motorcycle. That's, that's obviously the GoPro, uh, that type of an action camera. Uh, not necessarily a GoPro. Some of the clones, I've heard uh, a couple of commenters have said that, that the clones were pretty darn good and dirt cheap. The GoPro you do pay a premium for. So anyways, I decided, well, maybe I should focus on an SLR. And what ended up happening was I ended up uh, looking at a couple different ones, watching some auctions, and I had a bid in on one auction, and at the same time I was working another auction. So what ended up happening was I ended up buying two cameras, uh, inadvertently so um, I'm probably gonna keep them both and then maybe we'll do some two camera shoot uh, some two camera shots type of things which is something that uh, uh, one or two commenters had mentioned that uh, would be neat if I could try and do some of that so the uh, first camera I bought hasn't made it here yet there was a, a delay in getting it out the door by the shipper uh, they apologized and that should be here any day now um, the second camera I bought, which actually got here lickety split all the way from Marietta, Georgia, is this Nikon. 
Uh, I'd gone to the pawn shop and fell in love with a Sony model very similar to this and while I was looking for a deal online on the Sony's I found this Nikon. This is a Nikon uh, L830. The first camera I was looking at was an L820 and the guy was looking for best offers on it and I had given him a best offer and we had gone back and forth and he had messaged me back and said that like the best he could do on the camera was I forgot what it was but what ended up happening was I was like well I didn't accept his offer and I looked at active auctions and came across this one and I realized well this is an L830 so this is a newer model um, I'm not used to this thing yet. It, it, you touch these buttons, it just wakes up. <laughs> Anyways, this is an, uh, a newer model, and I ended up scoring this for seventy-eight dollars plus, I think, uh, like uh, twelve or fifteen dollars shipping. And this camera, uh, to the seller's credit, as described, it's clean as a whistle. Nice camera. This camera is um, full HD video mode so uh, it's got a 34 power optical zoom not not as you know robust a zoom as some other cameras but I think for my purposes I'm hoping this is going to work out really great uh, another drawback depending on how you look at it might be a drawback this camera uses regular um, well it uses double A batteries <laughs> and you can switch the mode and tell the camera that you've got alkaline batteries in there but you don't want to use alkalines because I think it'll just go through them so damn quick it'll cost you a fortune, especially in high def video mode. So what you can do is uh, what I did was I I picked up at a yard sale uh, this past summer. I picked up a couple of packs of these Energizer nickel metal hydride fast charge battery packs, and so that's got a charger that's got a cooling fan in it, and it can basically take the dead nickel metal hydride cells, four of them and bring them back to full charge in like 20 or 30 minutes. So that's what I've got in here right now for batteries. The uh, battery door, on, I've got an old Nikon Coolpix digital camera and it's funny because the battery doors were always an issue on these cameras. They tend to have issues. This one seems like it's redesigned a little bit better but you can still see that breaking this battery door is, is certainly a possibility. But these are what the, the Energizer Recharge uh, battery. This is a 1400 milli, milliamp hour battery nickel metal hydride. So this will recharge quickly and the bad part about I think the nickel metal hydrides if I'm not mistaken is they don't give you much warning before they die. They just kind of die suddenly. But um, so that's the new camera so the other drawback, it didn't come with a video card. It's got HDMI out, uh, yada, yada, yada. It's got a DC input here. So if you buy a uh, AC 5 volt adapter, I wanted to plug that in down here in the shop, I could literally never have the thing go dead on me. Um, so your video card goes here, it didn't come with one. And my problem I'm running into right now is that my current can't video card which is in the camera that's shooting right now the bloggy that will fit in here it's actually a micro SD and it's in a uh, oh shut up it's in an adapter and I was having trouble getting it to read and it turns out that on the side of the uh, adapter there's a tiny tiny little switch that actually allows you to lock and my switch is very loose, so every time I insert the card into the camera, it, it triggers the switch. So I was able to put a piece of tape on it and uh, get it into this camera this morning. But yesterday when I put it in this camera, initially I got it in and the camera was reading the card, but then, you know, I took it out for whatever reason and found that when I tried to put it back in again, the, card, the camera just kept saying the card was locked or something like that. So... So I'm going to fiddle around, try and get that card in this, this camera and, and switch over to this camera, the new one. All right, guys, we're shooting in full HD, uh, 1080, I don't remember if this is P or I, P, I think. So 
All right, so I got a uh, 32 gig card in there, and it's telling me I've got less than 27 minutes left of recording time. So part of that card is being is used up for the files from the other camera, which are in a different folder, and the camera doesn't see that. But make a long story short, uh, this is going to be one of these deals where we're going to have to get more cards. I have a 4 gig card. It's an older one. Uh, it's a SanDisk, genuine SanDisk, which is right here problem with that card is I don't know if you can see there's a little 4 in a circle above the 4. That's not the size. This is a 4 gig card but the little 4 means this is a class 4. It's a slower card and if you put a slower card in a camera like this it either won't work at all in video mode or what will have what will happen is the video will continue to shut off on you while you're in the middle of your video and what's happening is that the, the, the data that's being uh, taken in by the camera and processed and being sent to the card, the card can't handle it. It just can't can't handle the speed that that data needs to get in there. So, anyways, uh, so this is the new camera. This is the old. This is the old uh, Sony right here. So, I don't even know if I'm going to save this or what. This camera served me well outside. This actually shoots really well. But you look at the size of the lens, you know, compared to the size of the lens on the um, on the big SLR here, and this has got a more sensitive chip in it uh, that that actually takes in the uh, the imaging chip, so it's got much better light sensitivity and low light. So uh, I'm hoping this is going to be the uh, the solution to the the problem of the the, the uh, poor quality video that I've been having up till now. Oh, look, you can actually zoom while it's videoing. Oh, yeah, see, that's an improvement. All right, so what else did I buy? All right, so I showed you guys a while back. I showed you this Minotaurio caliper that I bought at the used tool store. Um, and this is an absolute Digimatic, genuine Minotaurio. And he originally wanted, I think, 40 bucks on this. This is a model 500-196, CD-6 inch. So it's a 6 inch caliper. And I went there and looked at it and noticed that the little thumb wheel, thumb screw for locking the caliper was missing. So I was able to get him to come down to either 30 or 35 on this caliper, which isn't horrible. Um, so every time you turn this caliper on, I have to zero it, which I find annoying. I don't know if that's normal or not. I don't know if like pressing that, maybe, what is that origin? Maybe that's what I'm doing wrong here on this one. All right, I just pressed and held the origin one, so now I'm curious to see whether or not uh, that solves that problem. Yeah, that's what it was. Operator error, Never mind. All right, so now I can shut this off and turn it back on and it's ready to go. I like this caliper. You know, <laughs> but I didn't have uh I wasn't you know, uh, my previous digital caliper is the uh the Pittsburgh Tools Harbor Freight piece of crap, so this didn't really have to uh to do much to beat that. I can actually uh order the uh, little replacement thumb screw from Mitotoyo for this. Uh it's only a, a couple of bucks. Uh the problem is it's going to cost me more than twice that in shipping so that's why I haven't done it yet I might end up doing that just because I think I'm going to sell this one because I had mentioned that shortly after I bought this one I had found at the pawn shop this one and a couple of things I looked at this a couple times and went back a couple times and went back and forth with him the first problem was it's got the True to pawn shop pricing, 199 bucks is what they had on this. Okay, now the interesting thing is this is the newer style case. You can tell it's the polypropylene, the way it's put together. This is the newer style case. It says for reference only, so that's the first thing I had to check into. Well, what's that all about? Uh, I've seen that on some equipment, and apparently that has to do with calibration that uh, 
what they're basically saying is you can use this for reference only, but you can't rely on it for... Uh, it, there's a certain level of accuracy you can't expect out of this because it hasn't been calibrated. So I'm assuming they're calibrated when they leave the factory, but then I guess they need to be calibrated at your workplace or something like that. So you open it up, and uh, it says right on here, it's a uh, Mitutoyo IP67. He actually thought that the IP67 was the model number of this. IP67, which is right here, IP67 means that this caliper is a coolant proof caliper that meets a certain standard of the industry for resistance to dust and liquid infiltration into the caliper. In other words, this caliper is supposed to be able to handle getting nasty and uh, that drives the price of this caliper up by quite a bit. So the first mystery was I couldn't get the battery door open because I wanted to see if it was any corrosion in there. So then I went online and started searching and well this says that this is a 500-196-20 CD slash X CD slash 6 inch CSX. Well, when I went back there, because I haggled with him a couple times on price, and when I went back there for my final offer to buy, I brought my caliper so I could swap the batteries in case the battery was dead in this. And also, I brought those gauge blocks just for giggles. Well, look at this. This is a 500 196. CD slash 6CS. Um, something screwy here. This can't be a 500-196. So, come to find out, because it's, I think it's because it's coolant proof or because it's newer, there's a screw right here, a recessed screw. There's a recessed hole right here with a screw in it. You gotta take that screw out to open this up. So, right off the bat, uh, I like this caliper better. This caliper has been around the block. It's a little more beat up. But um, the first thing I notice about this caliper is it's auto on, auto off. As soon as you grab the caliper and move it, it turns on. And if you leave it and let it sit, it'll turn off. And just like the, uh, just like the other Minotoyo, basically, you know, once you set the origin zero point, it's ready to go every time you open it up. This one's not missing the little thumb wheel, which is nice. It's a little chewed up over here, probably from a lot of coolant or wear over years. He had a big sticker like this. In fact, he had this sticker, I think, on the back here. No, he had another one. He had another sticker like this on the back of this, so we weren't able to see all of this. So we peeled this off, and I couldn't quite read the number on here when I was there, but now I can see that this is a model 500-752-10 CD-6 inch PSX. So this is a 500-752-10. This is a much more expensive caliper than the 500-196. So they had 199 on here and I'm not even sure where he got that price from but he usually uses like close to the price of the new as his starting price and you get a bargain from there. And initially I, when I first time I looked at these I said I think we're just too far apart. Well, he says, well, I guess because it had been sitting there a while and he doesn't get a lot of people coming in looking for this kind of stuff. We played around with it. End result was I went back to uh, just the other day and I ended up scoring this caliper for $60 plus tax. So it was roughly like 64 bucks. So I'm really pleased with this, cal uh, with this buy. The uh, thing that bothered me initially on this is when I look straight on at this display... Okay, when I look straight on at it, it looks very, very dim. So I thought it was the battery, but it turns out this has a low battery warning, and it's not displaying the low battery warning, I don't believe. Oh, it is displaying a B. I have to look up. I found the owner's manual online for this. But if I turn it just the slightest bit and look at it at an angle, it looks perfect. So I don't know whether or not that's just the design viewing angle. So, 
not quite sure. Matter of fact, I can look at it from this angle all the way up to about there, and it's it's good and crisp. And then as soon as you get to that point right there, it gets dim. So I don't understand that. So I don't know if anybody's got one of these, if they can tell me what their experience is with that. I, didn't, I don't recall having that problem at all with these. So with these... I can look straight on at these and they do get a little dimmer, but not much. So that's something I just don't understand what's going on with that. But that was the, uh, that was the big good deal on the machinist related items for, uh, for this week. Uh, I was going to shut it off, but I keep forgetting. I can't get used to the idea that you're just supposed to leave it on and it goes to sleep. So maybe I should look on eBay for a case for this thing. How'd that come out? Pretty good or what?